Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express controls and libraries. Deliver elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30 day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 458. In this episode, Scott talks with Matt Warren about how to make performance a feature of your application. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm talking with Matt Warren, who uh, is a performance expert. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Scott. Yes, very good, thanks. And you just uh, came off a talk at NDC London, uh, talking about performance as a feature. How did that go? Yeah, I think it went well. I was, uh, I was in the um, maybe you call it the graveyard slot Friday afternoon, but no, it's uh, there seemed to be a decent amount of people there, and it's um, I think there's other people who who want to find out about performance, like I've been trying to do myself. So yeah, I think it's a good seems to be a popular topic anyway. Mm-hmm. And you've made this kind of like your 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 favorite thing. Like performance is now what you do. You focused on performance and and decided that you would dig into it as deeply as you could. Yeah, certainly in terms of um, what I blog about and what I uh, spend my free time looking into, if you like, and things like that. So yeah, yeah, it's definitely my my focus, my uh, my pet hobby, maybe as a way of saying it. Yeah. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And on your on your blog at uh, mattwarren dot org, uh, you have dug into a number of interesting things, particularly uh, Stack Overflow. Even though you're not a uh, an employee of Stack Overflow, you've dug into how they deal with performance, and then also the uh, interestingly the Roslyn code base, the the code base of the open source C sharp uh, compilers. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think I, st- I think I, sh- I started with the Roslyn one. I, I can't remember, but I had the idea of looking into these public um, code bases or public projects or public companies, if you like, who are open about what they're doing, particularly around performance. And uh, in the case of Roslyn, um, thinking that it's uh, going to be a good example of a uh, how best practices for C sharp as it's. The C sharp um, compiler team writing it, and Microsoft C sharp devs, and then obviously Stack Overflow is a is a very uh, high profile site. Um, they're very uh, big on performance because uh, you know the top fifty website, and they uh, their basic thing is they run on uh, fairly high pro- fairly high spec machines, but they run with very little CPU usage. So they they really care about performance, and that's their way that they can get scaling. From my understanding, looking in. So yeah, I thought of I thought that I'd take a look at the, the code base in particular, but also some of the projects they might release, or with the Roslyn. There's all the discussions on Coplex that go into some of the things they're doing. There's been a few talks and stuff um, by some of the people on the Roslyn team have gone into this as well. So yeah. It's, to, to take a chance to see what was around and what from the performance side of things. Doesn't it seem like kind of when you talk to your your friends at other companies that are working on things, I know this is the case with my friends, is that they almost feel like they're taking performance as an afterthought and when it becomes a problem, then it's a big let's all freak out and try to make the system performant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that uh, there's always this thing. Oh, we'll, we'll we'll fix the performance before the site goes live, but we'll do it. You know, one of the sprints. You know, at the end, and we kind of know what happens to those sprints at the end. They get there's all the other stuff that that didn't quite get done in the, the previous ones. So yeah, I think there's definitely that it can be, uh, if not an afterthought, at least maybe not the the priority. And yeah, I think we'd all prefer to be able to fix a performance feature before our customers told us about it. That's probably the other part of it. Is you know we. Uh, if the first time we find we've got performance issues is when the site goes down, that's not a great time to be uh, fixing performance or trying to recreate performance or things like that. So it's, uh, yeah, the, the the idea behind the performance is uh, a feature is is the kind of tagline I've given to it. And it's something I, I uh, shamelessly borrowed from uh, Jeff Atwood. He, he came up with it in terms of Stack Overflow. But the idea is that we 
give it the same priorities that we might give um, security in our website or we might give uh, functional features or things like that and, and trying to see what that looks like at places that that's done, which I believe Stack Overflow is one and, and the Roslyn uh, code base is another. Yeah, it's always so surprising to me how how tolerant big enterprises uh, and the kind of the internal projects will people will be. Like they will be tolerant of five and ten second long, you know, page loads. And I, I just can't imagine that 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 is okay. It's it's almost like the old um, adage of you know how do you boil a frog? You boil a frog slowly so the yeah. frog doesn't actually know it's being boiled. And then if yeah. you bring a new employee in and say, hey, look at the performance on this site. It sucks. They're going to be like, this water is hot and jump right out. Like, why would you let it get this bad? Well, I don't know. The water kind of got hot slowly. Yeah. <laughs> well, well um, yeah, I mean, because there's, there's, there's quite a famous stat about Google in terms that they show you know they artificially made their web pages go some bit slower and they lost loads of customers and then like you say the other extreme is tends to be the internal apps or line of business apps or you know where you say like you say they might get slower and slower over time but even those you could probably argue you know if the if the internal app is being used by someone in your company and they're wasting 10 minutes a day half an hour a week you know that soon adds up over a year what could they be doing with that time so whilst they've got in some ways, they've got no choice. They can't leave you as a customer because it's an internal app. I still think even in there, you have to always justify the time to fix it versus the time it saves. But I think there's even an argument sometimes to not get into the situation you're talking about where these apps just get slower and slower over time. And, and before you know it, someone's spending half an hour a day to do something that should take five minutes sort of thing. Yeah, if you if you have the problem that your site is too fast and you have to slow it down artificially, that's a pretty good problem to have. I know yeah. that... Troy Hunt famously did that on his uh, Have I Been Pwned website. He added a little sleep because it was too fast. <laughs> because, you know, you have to have the sense of work being done. Work does yeah, take some milliseconds. Yeah, I think people have this expectation that if it happens instantly, it's not really done it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think from what I understand of that test with Google, they did like an A-B testing type thing and they saw, you know, that we don't all operate at the Google scale of things, but, you know, there's there's probably some scale for, for all of us where people are going to get annoyed or leave our site or uh, refuse to buy our product again or those sorts of things and where that comes, you know, I'm not saying we all have to shave half a second off our off our page load times, that's that's maybe an extreme, but there's there's some level of it and, and maybe yeah, not not continuously letting things like you say boiling the frog over and over until it's so bad and it's unusable google actually interestingly just last week is testing a new feature on their android devices where the check this out you'll 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 i want to interested in what you think about this their search results contain hints to what the most heavy thing uh the most heavy resource is on that particular page you're about to go to so that when you click on a result on mobile they will start prefetching like a large css file or a big javascript file in anticipation of you heading over to that page and apparently they're saying it's shaved 100 milliseconds off the average search result within uh that browser oh nice nice yeah because i know that i know before they've done certainly in chrome anyway they do pre-loading of links i think you might go to to do that sort of idea and it's yeah i think it's the way things are going isn't it everyone everyone the bar's being raised constantly isn't it in uh, gmail or whoever came along and showed what a fast javascript application looked like and now the old style applications that people were happy with i don't know 10 years ago or whenever it was people aren't happy with anymore and yeah like you say these these, these things are it's going up and up and uh, pulling out all the tricks i guess once you've done you know, you've minified your 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 page and your gzips and all that sort of stuff. You have to look at these things like prefetching. But yeah, that sounds like a nice nice technique. Well, and let's let's dig into this from a lo much lower level. The goal, of course, is to make things feel fast for the user. But taking performance seriously is kind of the most important thing. Uh, I noticed that on your analysis of the Roslyn code base, which is a really big code base, we're talking about two million plus lines of code. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it seemed like they were measuring uh, performance against a number of scenarios. Yeah, they had um, they had a couple of things. So so one thing they do is, um, like you say, sm they look at small, medium, and large solutions. I mean, my understanding again from looking on the outside in is that the Rosin as a compiler can't be slower than the previous compilers because us as you know devs using Visual Studio are not, not going to like that. And also, Rosin has a, a slightly unique thing in that it's doing something on every key press. There's the kind of big full build, but there's also all the stuff it does to power IntelliSense and all that sort of stuff going on. So there's there's quite tight things. There's there's 
um, and, and from what I understand is that they basically categorized it. So this is something that happens on a key press. So we have one level of performance. This is something that happens uh, in line with the build. So we have another type of thing, you know, so there's the, that kind of categorization. And then they took that and um, did that as a continuous build. Um, so every time they build, they run all this stuff and see that uh, if they, at the very least daily, I think, and possibly even more than that, in, in the same way that we run unit tests regularly to see if, the very the bit of code we've just checked in has, has broken something. Um, the same idea that we run performance tests and so that we know straight away that some bit of code that might be fixing something has also um, harmed the performance. Um, and they have that idea and they look at uh, um, elapsed time, average time, percentile, that sort of thing. They dig in quite deeply and, and making sure that they uh, cover at the very least, the hot paths and these things that happen on every key press, but I'm sure they've got in the background this idea of, well, what does this performance look like if someone opens up a solution with a thousand CS projects files in it and, and, and what's, what's going to happen then? And, and they did that with, you know, with, um, for lack of a better word, uh, manager sponsorship, right? This isn't a hobby. This isn't someone doing this in their spare time. Like mm. this is important. It's baked into the team that, that these performance numbers matter. Yeah, that's, there's interesting. There's other picks I've picked up from, from, uh, from some of the stuff on discussions. And my understanding is that there's a, at least one engineer or maybe others who deal with performance. And so they would might take a look at the base code because you, you don't want to necessarily prioritize performance in, in everything you do because sometimes, um, there's a whole thing about premature optimization and you don't want to, uh, optimize stuff for the sake of it or you don't want to optimize something that, uh, the, the the time it takes to optimize is not worth the payback you get from from the faster code so from my understanding that someone's come in at some point in the in the development obviously they're smart devs and they've had this in you know they've tried to write the best code they can while they're doing it going through but then someone stepped in and, and looked at particular hot paths profiled it and tried to understand well no this part is going slowly what can we do here or this part is not performing uh, as quickly as we need it to we can uh take a look here so yeah like you say it's i think there's a something structured it's not a it's not an accident i think that's that's part of it as well you 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 have to take some steps to do this stuff you can't like it, you can't necessarily rely on just finding performance issues in development by accident because you don't test in the same way you don't have the same setup as production so you ha there's some possibly some deliberate steps you have to take to say look this is a common part of our page or this is a common part of our product. Let's see what this, how this behaves when we have 10,000 users or we run it 20 times a second or whatever the, the scenario might be as opposed to just running it once and see, see how it works out. Yeah, I think that one of the things that beginners fall into is this idea of, uh, of micro benchmarks, right? You know, they think performance mm -hmm. is a unit test that they put a little timer around and they maybe shove a thousand of something into a, into a bundle or a list of some kind and do some operation. They go, yeah, that's performance, but that may not be reflective of how the product is ultimately used. And in the Roslyn examples you gave, those are all real world things. Like this is when a normal person types and IntelliSense pops up and a normal person types at this speed. This is reflective of an end to end performance test. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely, I, um, the idea that you, you first look at something end to end and then, yeah, you may, you may end up writing a, some micro benchmark at the end because you've identified one bit of code that you know should always perform under one millisecond or it should always perform, uh, it should never slow down build to build, that sort of thing. But yeah, you, you're right. You should never, uh, start in just micro benchmarks because it's too easy to get into details. That bit of code might, be called once in the entire um, uh, runtime of your application so anything you do there is not going to make the difference whereas there might be another bit of code that is called a thousand times a second or a thousand times a minute or whatever that you don't you know, haven't looked into so i think there is a place for micro benchmarks um if you can uh, start with the higher level stuff and then drill down if you determine that there's one bit of code that needs to always be very quick uh, that is justified, but yeah, as you say, it's and and, and there's a there's there's tricky stuff with you know d benchmarks. There's a 
uh, you go on Stack Overflow the site and you'll see the ways people can get benchmarks wrong and you can measure things incorrectly. You cannot take account um, of the .NET jitter. There, there's stuff that you need to consider once you get into the level of micro benchmarks to, to be sure that you re are, really are measuring the, the application, uh, the, sorry, the bit of code you think you're measuring. You need to run stuff like you mentioned several times to get a, an accurate representation of uh, how long it really takes and things like that. So it's, uh, yeah, there's a bit of an art to, 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 to doing it and, uh, it's, uh, I think it's something that, that you can get wrong if you're not careful. How important do you think it is for performance metrics to be kind of up front and center? Sometimes they're buried off in some operations dashboard or even worse in someone's text file somewhere in a log that no one looks at. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago, the idea that you, you kind of really like to know about your performance issues before your customers are telling you about it or before the the CEO runs the site and it behaves badly. So, the uh, yeah, where, wherever whatever you can do to get them, whether that's alerts. I mean, one of the problems with alerts you often find is that there's so many of them, so you, having more alerts isn't necessarily a good thing sometimes because people just learn to ignore them. So, mm. meaningful alerts, have them in a place so you can find them easily, like you say, don't have to dig into them. I really like the example from Stack Overflow. They they released a tool called Mini Profiler, and it there's other ones available like Glimpse. Glimpse probably uh, maybe more fully featured, but Mini Profiler was was one of the early ones. Maybe that, that it sits in the corner of your uh, web page, or it can work in other scenarios, but it was mostly tailored for that and gives you a a, a drill down of where the time's taken to render that page, database time, uh, time in your controller, time in your front end, in your rendering your view, these sorts of things, and and having that. Um, yeah, I think that that's that's something that's very valuable. Having that in in development, so your devs can get an idea of, you know, if you do, if you're a, as a dev, you're hitting the development page five times a day, and you see suddenly something go go a lot slower, you're going to investigate it then, as opposed to to wait till later. But yeah, so I think that sorry. you think it's important to put those things like like if you're a developer not in production, or even if you're maybe in production but you're logged in with some magic powers as a developer, you should see perf like right there. Yeah, I think um, apparently there's. I think there's been times where they found perf issues in Stack Overflow because their devs or the yeah they don't they don't expose it to users of the site, but whoever the devs and others get to see it, and they've you know someone sitting there and suddenly a page takes 400 milliseconds when they expect their page to take less than 100, and you know that's enough. And I'm sure they have metrics that would flag that up as well. But having that, uh, yeah, if, if if nothing else, I think having that as the first step is is a great way to go to it stops the thing of like, oh, I didn't realize the page was behaving slowly. It kind of makes it a bit harder for devs in some way because they, you know, they've got no excuse, but it does. Uh, any time I've been working on a, a site or some code and we turn that on, we've, we've always been um, slightly surprised about what we found and we've gone away to fix up things straight away. If, if nothing else, it'll tell you if you're hammering the database with lots of calls and that's, that's uh, normally a bad sign of performance. If uh, you're, you know, select 10 plus ones, it'll flag things up lo- like that for you. But, um, it's always hard to figure out where time is being taken. So having something that tells you that um, as soon as you can see that is, is, is definitely a benefit, yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Glimpse and uh, before that, uh, Mini Profiler. I think Glimpse does most of what Mini Profiler does now. But yeah. The idea to, in, you know, in the browser, on the page, see that something went wrong. And I would even go so far as to, as to like, if I were in development, uh, you know, change the background color of the page, make it red. If it, you know, yeah. if it didn't uh, come back in a certain number of seconds, really put it up front. If, if, if things are, are not performant in a deeply unperformant way, everyone should know. Yeah. That's a nice idea, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You, you want something, whether it's dashboards or something. Yeah. Cause it's, cause if, Generally, you know, if, if something, if stuff starts performing badly, there's a very high chance that your customers are going to see that. It's, un, it's unlikely that you're only seeing that as a dev looking at the site as opposed to customers. So yeah, you, you'd want to know as soon as possible. I think it's funny that people are, are really willing to put in, you know, lights and uh, traffic lights, traffic robots to, to tell you whether or not the build is failing. But you don't see that as much if performance is, is not up to snuff. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, I, I, when I, when I was looking around at this particular thing, there was, there's a few, there's a few, um, places I found it, but it's, it's not so many. I don't think it's, um, whether it's a tooling thing or, or a thing. I mean, 
like this whole premature optimization, you don't want to get down to the point where everything, you know, if any slight bit of your code runs slower, you, you completely fail it. But yeah, I think there's a sort of middle ground. And one library I did see it in is, is Node of Time from John Skeet, his mm-hmm. library where he, um, it's, it's kind of a system level library. He's in effect writing a, re- a replacement for date time and uh, date time offset and all the uh, international, international nation stuff that goes on with, with dates and times. And so that, it, you are using that library and you're not expecting that library to be um, slow in any way. So I think that's a definite place where there's no real premature optimization because it's uh, something you want to be quick. So he has on every build, he has um, performance tests that run and will say this bit, this particular um, performance test is running slower than the last build. Uh, Is this something you want to, you want to sort out and then, yeah, but no, I think that's a nice, they probably are. I think that, I think in the Roslyn anyway, I, I would imagine that they, if if not breaks the build, it certainly flags it up if things get slower build to build. Because, um, you know, if they've gone to the effort of putting all this in place, it's, it would be strange to not be acting on it. Well, that brings up another interesting point. There's the there's the uh, performance as it is now, but then there's that historical performance, right? I mean, it's one thing to say uh, this page is red or whatever because it's less than two seconds, uh, or it's more than two seconds in the time it took to load, but that doesn't put anything in context. There's no graph there to express that, you know, well, we did double performance from before. It's still not correct, but it, we are moving in a certain direction. So what do we do to collect those those statistics and, and, and look at performance over time? Yeah, that's something I've been wondering myself, trying to look around to see what's around it. I mean, I think a lot of um, CI tools or tools that will run on, on builds and, and do unit tests and show graphs of their pass and failures, I think a lot of those have an option for you to output some other metric. So if, if the tool offers that, then that's one way I think is so they they generally automatically pick up the number of pass and fails of tests and you can see those graphs but from my understanding that some of those tools offer a way to say you know we'll write we'll have one particular bit of code that runs on every build and it outputs a metric that represents the time that we care about and then we can graph that um other than that it, it may be a case of pushing those graphs into some other third party tool that just does graphs in general there's there's online tools you know graphite or things like that that run that mm-hmm. can just basically have rest endpoints and you can push data in so that might be an option so yeah i, th- I think it's i think it's something that when i've seen it they seem to be hand rolled solutions from the ones i've seen so far so i don't know if it's uh not a solved problem or or i'm just missing the ones maybe it could be that i'm just missing the ones that, that do it for you well, certainly there's tools like, uh, like Stack Overflow's Ops Server that is absolutely amazing piece of work mm. at the complete dashboard. They use it for SQL performance, for Redis, for their elastic search. Uh, and they can look at things like CPU utilization in, you know, live over time, which, and it's pretty extraordinary and it's all open source. So we, certainly we could build on top of things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, that's yeah. No, I'd I'd, um, I'd seen that previous. That's a nice tool, actually. Yeah, yeah. And and, and like uh, the other stuff they do, it's nice that they they make it freely available for <laughs> for that. From my understanding, the the tools they couldn't either find tools that were tailored to their need, or you know, I don't I don't think they write tools themselves on a whim. You know, they they haven't got the time to just be always doing their own tools. So I you know I, I trust that they had a good reason <laughs> for writing that because the commercially available ones weren't weren't doing what they're doing. But yeah, it's nice that they've spun that out and, and made that available. Um, yeah, yeah, and and I think that 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 is a good thing in terms of this single dashboard, one place where you can get this stuff. And yes, you might drill down further, but not having to look at some logs that are on one machine and and correlate those with something else that's going on another machine, and then you know, the, and then hope the machine hasn't recycled in the cloud and you've lost those logs or whatever. So having something central that that deliberately collects this stuff in a way that not only alerts you but gives you a, a way of going back to look over look over time or or um, yeah to spot these issues. Uh, well, and it's you know, so like, important that that not be a toy or someone's spare time project. Like, you need a manager or a boss to to accept that this is important. This is a thing that someone really needs to work on. I mean, I don't think Ops Server was, was I hope not. I would have to ask the Stack Overflow folks. I certainly hope that wasn't written, you know, in someone's uh, on someone's weekend. No, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, you're right. Yeah, doing going back to the Rosalind thing, making it a deliberate thing. Yeah, yeah. From, from all my, um, from the outside looking at the Stack Overflow, they they do this stuff because they're serious about it. They 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 blog about 
their times when they weren't as fast as they wanted to be they 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 write tools um yeah i think it's it's a it's a, it's a culture and there's maybe a better way of describing it in terms of we deeply care about performance you know not not that they're sacrificing other things security mm-hmm. or whatever that's going on as well but they they care about performance because in their world in terms of page render times and stuff like that that matters for google results or that matters for a good experience for the thousands of devs who are using the site or, or it matters because they can run on on the, the hardware they have and, and not have to you know they can cope with burst loads and things like that i think is a combination of those things that well, what about benchmarking that. you've said that, that there's an art to benchmarking i think people sit down and they start measuring things and then they realize that they weren't really measuring at all what they thought they were yeah so there was um there's a, there's um a lot of it comes down to when you get to a certain level there's categories so um milli benchmarks micro benchmarks so some of these things apply to but once you get down to a low level you really have to worry about um or well, one of the main things is the dot net jitter so without doing a whole tutorial on that basically we we write c sharp code or vb.net or whatever we write um that gets turned into il and then uh, compiled into AI and then at runtime the jitter kicks in and turns that into code that runs on the machine and there's other scenarios but generally that's the, the main way that happens and the jitter can basically optimize in any way it sees fit that doesn't change the behavior of your program and, and often when you're writing a micro benchmark you're calling a bit of code in a loop and the jitter might just say hey you're not using the value you're just calling this code you're not doing anything with the value it returns or you're not even returning a value so one of the one of the, the scenarios i found that you, you have to be careful is that when you get down to a certain level if you're benchmarking things at quite a low level there's a chance that the jitter will just optimize it out and and the other side of that is you have to make sure that you are running in release mode you're not running inside a debugger you know when visual studio when you run inside a debugger it doesn't optimize the code in the same way as when you uh, launch the executable outside of visual studio for instance there's a few things there you have to worry about because the debug mode is useful for debugging but it's slower by by definition because it puts in things to help make the debugging experience nice um, and another one is you want to try and isolate as much as you can the garbage collection. If you're running something in a loop for a long period of time, there may be a point where the garbage collection kicks in and a lot of uh, benchmarks will, in effect, call GC collect, the thing we're never told to call for real in production. But in a benchmark, that's one thing if we're talking about .NET. Anyway, we want to make sure that the, we do what we can to get the garbage collection out of the way because it will, it will artificially change the speed of your benchmark, in effect, if, if the garbage collection kicks in in the middle. Um, How often do you think people are overthinking these things? They, they're, you know, they're they're doing pretty basic work. They're going to the database. They're pulling stuff back, spinning through uh, collections, and then suddenly they're off tweaking .NET GC settings because they convinced that they are a unique snowflake. Yeah, no, there there definitely is that. When I when I do a talk and I say some of these um, things that I've seen in Roslyn or other places, I, I put a big warning saying, please do not go back and change your code to match any of these scenarios. You you have to be <coughs> measuring this stuff first to work out if it's even valid. It's quite nice as engineers. We quite you know maybe if you like to uh, look at low level stuff or whatever, it's quite nice to go in and say, oh, I tweak the the gc or i i made something that will run one millisecond faster over a thousand runs or whatever but you know yeah we need to kind of see the uh the wood for the trees if you like if if that's the analogy that that yeah we're not just doing this for the for the sake of it and there is there is some times when it's valid whether it's say something like node time where you're a, a system level library or it's stack overflow where you're running at that performance level or even a regular app if you identify what your hot path is and you know if it's running 20 times a second then you know shaving a millisecond off can can help there so there is there's scenarios where it's valid but yeah it's definitely a very easy trap to fall into so you know i've seen this nice trick i'm gonna rewrite all my code i mean one of the things that in roslin and hot pass is they disallow link they say we're not going to use link because there's when you run link uh, the, the query language or the, the you know the nice functional way of, of doing stuff in net it's fantastic but behind the scenes to to give you that nice experience as a developer it does a bit of extra work than the old um for each loop way um in certain scenarios so they they there's been times where they rewrote some link queries into the old style queries to just minimize um the extra work that was going on that would eventually turn into extra work for the garbage collector and they identified that was a hot path they identified that there was extra work being done there and they identified that getting rid of link uh in that scenario was a good thing to do but i definitely don't think getting rid of link as a common thing is is you know link is fantastic 
write some more readable code, people can understand it. Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, there's definitely stuff that's. This is a, a good good example for if you care about performance in this bit of code, but don't do this elsewhere in the code base because more often than not, performance uh, code that is good from a performance point of view is less readable code because it's it's not the code someone would have written the first time around. So this this one term, I think you might be saying it quickly, and not everyone uh, who listens will be have heard that the term you're saying is is hot paths. Hot paths, yes. Sorry, so this hot is, path. This is yeah. the code execution paths that the compiler where kind of most of the execution time is spent. It's kind of like the 80-20 rule, right? 20% of the code is being used 80% of the time. Yeah, exactly that thing. So, you you, you know, it's different. So, on, on, on a website, it may be the the bit that does the validation of the user on every request that's shared across every request on every page on the site or on, on a uh, Roslyn, it's the bit that's done on every every time we hit a key in uh, Visual Studio and Roslyn does something in the background to reprocess that, that would be considered as Roslyn's hot path. So that, that varies across applications. I've previously worked in um, applications that run in factories and are constantly taking images of, of things going under along a conveyor belt. And so our hot path is we have to make sure we're we're processing the image before the next image comes along. We've got a fairly constrained thing. So it, it varies, you know, whatever your application might be, the, 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 it's the bit that's done more often than not, like you say, the 80, the 80, 20 rule. And yeah, certainly in Roslyn, I think it's more of a general term. It's referred to as the hot path. Yeah. And this is, this is uh, more, this is useful for more than just performance also for, for testing and things like test coverage. People often talk about uh, how I want to get a hundred percent test coverage. But, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that the piece that you're deciding to do test coverage of is is even happening very often. Really, I'd rather have 100% test coverage on the 20% of the code that everyone is in all the time. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true as well, actually. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, if if, if in an ideal world, like you say, you know, if we could get 100% test coverage, maybe that's worth something. Although even that, sometimes people argue about whether that's something worth aiming for. But, yeah, if you're constrained with time, yeah, certainly looking at the bits that that every user is using um, versus the bit of the site that gets used once a week or something. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, there's always priorities, isn't there? It could be, uh, it often comes down to business or something like that or whatever's driving where the developers spend their time. But uh, yeah, yeah, we can uh, sometimes uh, concentrate our, our time on the wrong parts. Maybe the parts are more interesting to us, but but not not what our users use. Well, you have a wealth of great information at mattwarren.org. Underneath the recent pages, you go into the .NET Garbage Collector, the Roslyn Codebase, RavenDB, Redis, the Art of Benchmarking, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. No problem. Thank you very much, Scott. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.